Hey, everyone. Krills Hello. Thank you both. Uh, thank you, Krills, for staying up late on a Friday. Uh, to, <laughs> that wasn't my call, by the way. I'm sure that was, excuse me, Brandon's doing. Oh, yes. Thank you. I appreciate that, Jeff. I mean, I said, Krills, yes. He needs to be at home on a Friday night to answer questions. That was what I said specifically, <laughs> if I remember. I said, but I heard it to do something fun. He's like, no, that is not the way. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway so we need to have the the crisp microphone for the for the crisp microphones for the last two sessions so yeah uh, alton exactly. and kareel's got got drew, drew the straws for those yeah curls can we hear some pops i want to see if Pop. oh nothing there's nothing <laughs> that's that's James what you pay for it james henry said before that he 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 said he can tell the difference that you actually have the the SM7B and not the the MV7 with the pop filter on it. So I guess there's a uh, there's a, a, a crispness to the to the audio there. But I don't know. Good. James' setup is chef's kiss, so I don't know what he's <laughs> talking about. Can't imagine. Are we gonna have to? Are we gonna have over. to go bring James back in here so we can talk about <laughs> microphones for? Just longer? gonna be comparing. He's gonna <laughs> be doing a pop, and I'll be doing a pop. <laughs> That's right. Alton has a has a, a different mic also, and I we had talked about that one. He, he, you had used that one previously, though, right, uh, Alton? Yeah, I, I got this um, to to try and experiment with some music stuff, and then realized that mm -hmm. I'm a horrible singer, and uh, <laughs> not even a dramatic amount of effects could improve that. So it, it sat in a box for a while until I uh, upgraded my video conferencing setup. So that's mm -hmm. a good thing about 2020, I guess. Yeah, definitely, definitely. That it sounds sounds good. Also, so it worked. It worked out either way. I think. <laughs> All so right. Let's see. Yeah, we got some questions in the queue. Do you have it pulled up? On my uh, yes, I will start out with uh, this one. This one came out halfway came out of the chat, and half another came from me. And this one's for Alton. Uh, so what's the difference between an ortho linear and a mechanical keyboard? That's what, that's what I really want to, want to know since you introduced that in the, in the talk there. Yeah. Well, the first, the first thing is that when you talk about it, you really sound like an elitist, which is part of the mechanical <laughs> activity hobby. Um, the, the second thing is, a an ortho linear keyboard, all of the keys are arranged in a straight up and down fashion. So actually I'll, I'll pull up one half of my keyboard. So you can okay. see that it's just a grid mm. instead of being offset. Um, and it, it says that it, you know, is a little less taxing on your fingers. I don't know if I believe that it's still a keyboard, but it does look cool subjectively. Yep. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Like I said, there are plenty of, uh, Narwhalians who, uh, are keyboard enthusiasts. I call them, uh, which, which will appreciate the, that, that, the, yeah, the uh, uniqueness of that keyboard or that type yeah. of style of keyboard, I think. All right. Uh, let's Too see. Too much time talking about keyboards at Narwhal. <laughs> Only That's the, to... I'll give the inside, the in, so a little bit of inside baseball here. Whenever we have a meeting and it's quiet, I throw this, I'll say, so who, who, who wants to talk about keyboards? And then some, any person was like, oh, I heard someone say something about keyboards. I must tell you about my split uh, four key keyboard now and uh, how it's great and I only need four keys the number keeps decreasing every time also it's always like I was I have a you can tell how much of a keyboard enthusiast, enthusiast I am I have a plain uh, Mac keyboard uh, space gray keyboard and uh, somebody told me that was too many keys that they only had 22 keys on there on the keyboard so it kind of the number keeps going down from 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 the no it's 44 keys I think and then it keeps going down from there. <laughs> the the person, the most extreme person I've ever known is uh, a guy. Victor and I worked with a Google named Chirayu, uh, who had like foot pedals and all kinds of auxiliary switches and things. Was a Vim superstar. Had uh, yeah, he had all sorts of Tmux scripts, and he had a whole <laughs> he had a whole wiki internally of all his little scripts to share with everyone and all his little. Uh, tr tips and tricks he's just like the sounds little... like it's a uh, super close to actually playing like an organ you know you got to utilize yeah. all of your four limbs you got mm -hmm. stuff working in the, with the with the feet he would everything. be a great organist 
Yeah, I actually talked to the captioner or one of the captioners yesterday, and uh, she showed me the the keyword that they used to do the captioning with, and it was something I had never seen before, and I was amazed at how uh, how they even use like that type of keyboard to do the captioning at that speed. So, learn something new every day. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we'll jump into some of these. Some real questions. questions here. Yeah, real questions. Those are real questions. People want to know about keyboards and things like that. So we get to get to talk to the, the panelists. Uh, okay, so it's a question for uh, Alton. When would you justify using a custom uh, migrator? Yeah, so custom migrators are not maybe something that you would see in a normal NX workspace. I think a great example of this would be um, if you were going to take an approach kind of like Gregory talked about yesterday, um, where you're bringing something that maybe isn't a first party supported framework or language into NX. Um, so a good example of that would be using something like the .NET plugin, or there's um, a Go plugin out there. Um, and so if the authors for those plugins wanted to provide something that would either update um, the NX configuration, or if there were framework features that were easily updatable, they could provide those as a custom migrator, but it's maybe not something that you would use every day unless you were trying to really dive into the, the plugin system. I see. Yep. So um, I see. Yeah. Like I said, NX plugin. And I think Nathan Walker kind of alluded to that uh, during his talk yesterday when he talked about the native script plugin that they have that they use to help. Uh, the projects that are using native script or, or XPlat help them migrate across their versions also, which I thought was, was interesting there. And they're probably a great example of that too. Just like mm -hmm. if you could go look at their source. So. Yeah. Yeah. I'll say uh, that's what I normally do. Look at when people want to talk, look at uh, plugins and things like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Look at like the source on the Narwhal uh, or NX project. And then you can also take a look at other plugins to kind of see what, how they're doing that. Cause I think those are probably the two most common, uh, use cases there. Uh, question for Kirill's like when you were going through, like when you were going through putting the talk for NX cloud together, how, I guess, how did you go about like building that progression or did you learn anything about how, I guess, speeding up CI for some reason, like that progression of how you can, those steps you can take to like speed, speed up your processes once you eventually get to a place where you need like NX Cloud and distributed task execution? Uh, yeah, I mean, I kind of thinking about all the features that NX Cloud has, I kind of started thinking about it how like it's, it's essentially like an onion. You get some, some speed mm -hmm. from enabling the distributed caching and then once that's once you can sort of hit a limit with that, you can there's other features that can can take that even further, distributed task execution and so forth. So uh, that's kind of how I kind of started playing around with it, um, spending a bit more time with it, because uh, obviously I'm not actually working on the NX Cloud as a product. My uh, mostly work on NX um, mm -hmm. you know, on the Next.js vertical. So uh, it was definitely um, interesting to kind of find that aspect of it and play around with it and see what what's actually. Uh, try and get it into an actual like use useful benefit that people can relate to in their day to day developer life, you know? Yeah, definitely. I think there would be, um, like, like you said, working on the next JS, uh, vertical, definitely be some things they could take advantage of there. And like, we do a lot of things with next JS, like the docs are written in next JS. And we, yep. of course we take advantage of, uh, NX cloud there and, uh, that setup can, of course, be um, used in Next.js or deploy with Next.js on like their platform with Vercel and all that. So exactly. definitely some good, some good points. Or NX Cloud can can scale to different environments, so you're not necessarily locked down to one like CI environment there. Exactly. Uh, let's see. There is uh, another question for Alton here. Um, is there any way to update to latest NX without being forced to update to the latest corresponding version of Angular? Yeah, so this is a good question. I think what um, people need to keep in mind when asking this question is kind of the way that, that 
NX packages itself. So um, a lot of the benefits that NX is able to give as kind of a build framework come with being integrated into um, a corresponding JavaScript framework or whatever else that we're giving. So Victor talked about this earlier in the kind of Q&A session, but hmm. we're a bit limited by what framework authors decide to do. So in some cases, I think that yes, it's possible, but it's not a guarantee that we're willing to make because we don't always know all of the internal changes. And mm -hmm. the NX team works really hard to try and make sure that things are going to keep working, but ultimately some things are out of our control. But the follow-up question to you that you know, you know, I don't maybe expect the answer um, or expect an answer for is, why would you want to upgrade your NX version and not just get Angular with it? Right. That's mm -hmm. we ship the migrators so that process is easy. I don't know. Just something to think about. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes people uh, have edge cases or things like that that make can make it tricky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, and like you said, just to add on that, like we, the versions that we ship, of course, we have to test all that and make sure that it's uh, those versions that we that we kind of pin to for releases kind of all work together and run all of our battery of end-to-end -end tests and uh, things like that, that make sure that when you upgrade that you, we're working, on, we're all like working against a known set of versions. And that's mm -hmm. just another thing that kind of comes along with the, the single version policy that Enix uh, kind of promotes there. Uh, so definitely, definitely helps out. Like I said, you, and we, one more thing I'll add to that is that there used to be where we were as like kind of on the same release cycle as uh, the latest version of Angular. And I think with version 11, maybe version, maybe version 12, I think we released version 12 actually before the next major version of Angular was released. And part of that process was being able to, uh, part of that work was being able to release a version of NX, like a feature version of NX that also maybe included a major version of Angular and still have all those migrations and things work pretty seamlessly there. So, um, and it gives, you know, it gives us some flexibility there of timelines. And uh, if we, like I said, want to release on a different schedule there. Uh, let's see, we got well, we got another another fun question in here for uh, Alton uh, and uh, Kareels. I don't know if you if you use these also. You you feel free to uh, chime in here. Uh, but the question is, what is your favorite Pokemon? <laughs> oh, this is incredibly valuable content. This is what you got your <laughs> your NX Conf ticket for. Yes, um, that's right. I don't know my my favorite Pokemon. Maybe. Turtwig, one of the kind of middle gen ones, not super old school, mm -hmm. not super modern, you know, right in the middle, peak nostalgia for me when I was like 10. So, mm -hmm. you know, there we go. That might age some of the other people that are watching this, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I'll, I'll readily admit, I don't know anything about uh, Pokemon. So uh, you could tell me whichever one you wanted to say, and I'd have been like, that's a good choice. That was probably the one I would choose also. And I didn't <laughs> Uh, <laughs> for the uh, the one, which one that actually is, and I know Zach is is into those also. He did some. I think he actually did some live streams on, like trying to build a game with uh, uh, out of like the I don't know if it was out of the Pokemon universe or uh, I see some people in the chat saying other other Pokemon names also that uh, that they uh, enjoy. So it definitely gets some. <laughs> he definitely has some other. Uh, other uh, people that are interested in that. Here's a, uh, a good question. Sorry, this isn't about Pokemon or keyboards, but um, this is for Kirill. So from, for NX Cloud caching, the question is, um, do you have to have the same node version? And I, I would uh, extrapolate that to a broader question of like, how do you, with, how do you account for differences in, in between environments? Uh, yes. With caching? Yes. So, and it's actually not a, a problem that's not necessarily specific to NX cloud distributed caching. It's more, it, it's also got to do with NX local caching as well. So NX has a, an optional, uh, option called runtime cache inputs. 
um, which essentially you could take things into consideration like uh, node versions or some environment variables. And uh, I think we've, we've linked to a um, to the docs uh, where that question was asked on, on Slack. So that essentially allows you to take some runtime uh, values, like again, like node version, for example, into the account when uh, cache, when the hash for your uh, source code essentially is created. So uh, if you run the same command against the same source code on two different node versions, if you're using node version um, uh, in the runtime cache inputs, then the cache would be not not necessarily invalid, but the cache wouldn't work whenever you switch between node versions. So it would actually rerun um, your commands rather than pulling them from cache. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think that, yeah, like you said, you can you can also cause like customize those uh, flags, or if you want to add some additional things in there to cache or to bust the cache with. Uh, you can I think you can add those in the NX JSON file where the the task runner is for yeah. NX Cloud, right? Exactly. Yeah. And here's another uh, another NX Cloud one that I don't actually know the answer to. So sometimes it's necessary to clear your your cache um, where uh, skip NX cache flag doesn't necessarily. Okay. The question is. Is there a way to is there a way to disable the distributed cache temporarily? To say run this without distributed cache. Yeah, it's an yeah I've seen that question. It's an interesting one that I immediately didn't have an answer to. The one thing that came to mind was that um, essentially you could have a workspace that isn't connected to an X cloud at all, right? Uh, and so. In fact, whenever you're creating a new workspace and you know what it prompts you to use NX Cloud, yes or no, if you if you say yes, at least in the recent version since um, uh, last time I checked, when you say yes, there's actually some uncommitted changes that you have in your workspace, and those are actually the changes that are um, that you get that are um, that essentially enable the NX Cloud integration. So uh, the most important part is that in your NX JSON. Uh, it changes the task runner, the default task runner that is used, uh, and it points it from the default NX one to the NX cloud one. So one thing that came to mind, if you just want to essentially disable distributed cache or NX cloud altogether for, for I guess, a day or an hour or for whatever, whatever task you're doing, uh, I guess you could essentially revert that uh, and revert to using the default task runner. Um, but that's just what came to mind to me. But again, Al Alton, if you... As a person who's actually working on NX Cloud, perhaps maybe there's a, something that I might know when it comes to this, so definitely chime in. Uh, but that's what I'll do. Yeah, the, that's, a, that's a great answer. Um, the other thing that you can do is you can actually just remove your access token um, from nx.json. Right. And um, the NX Cloud task runner will default to running everything on the normal NX task runner. And so you will have achieve, achieved the same thing. Right, that's definitely simpler then just, just changing the back, the task runner altogether. That's a good one, yeah. Mm. Uh, okay, we've got another one. Are there any downsides to having lots of things drawn from NX, ca cl NX Cloud Cache, or NX Cache, I guess, in, well, I guess it's me more specifically, NX Cloud Cache. And this is maybe uh, referring to having te uh, tests that deal with uh, different time zones or Maybe di different date times or any other use cases like that, or if you can, it, that you can think of. Yeah, that's another interesting one as a use case. Uh, well, I guess one positive of NS Cloud is that it does give you quite a lot of um, kind of power to configure what you want cached. You, mm -hmm. you know how there's a cacheable commands array, for example. So you can customize that to um, to sort of to to, 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 to tailor it to your needs. Um, as well as, uh, once again, if you use something that, like, like runtime cache inputs, uh, perhaps you can tailor that a bit more where you take something into the account that you should be when uh, create, creating hashes for your test files again, which I think was the example from the question. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, but at the same time, I agree with, with another answer that, that was given for that uh, question is that perhaps, yeah, if you have kind of non-deterministic tests, then uh, yeah, it's... Yeah. It seems like a, a broader concern potentially, <laughs> uh, but again, there's yeah. there's 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 definitely things you can you can do to help to tailor it more specifically to yeah. what you're trying to do. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that also. If you 
if you're running tests against uh, a certain date that you don't have any control over, then it's gonna you're naturally gonna run into that test that just happens to fail on some certain day for some certain reason, and then uh, it'd be better to fix that test to have it under something a predictable date that you can control, as opposed to um, having to make that trade off of uh, using the whether the cloud it should be in the cloud cache or, or whether you're getting those cash hits or not. But that's assuming you don't hit the cash in the first uh, one anyway. So uh, get answered there. Let's see if we have any other questions. Or actually, I think we're just over our time and ready to yep. close it out. Oh, cool. Uh, well, thank you, Alton and Kirill's. Uh, Thank you for the talks, all the effort you put in there. And thank you for hanging out with us for the Q&A for some technical and non-technical questions. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> we'll uh, talk to you all soon. Thanks for yeah, everything thank you, you very did. much.